Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, your creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Hello, my recently voted friends. Yes, and uh, well, that makes a lot of us because we did some voting in Canada. We did, we did. Too. At least in BC, yeah. There's a, oh yeah, there were civic yeah. elections everywhere. Voting a palooza. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadian schmoes chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Listeners who feel they are in crisis can contact the Crisis Text Line in Canada by texting HOME to 686868. In the US or UK, text 741741. The service will match you with a volunteer counsellor who is supervised by a licensed, trained mental health professional. Crisis Text Line is free 24-7 support for those in crisis. For more information, go to crisistextline.ca in Canada or crisistextline.org globally. William Avery Bishop was born in Owen Sound, Ontario on February 8th, 1894. A few years ago. few. Everyone called him Billy. When the First World War broke out, as with many young men of his day, Billy was off to Europe to do his part. By the end of the war, Bishop claimed he had survived more than 170 air battles and said that he had shot down 72 German aircraft. Damn! This number left him only three behind René Fonck of France and eight behind the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, who had 80 kills. That's close behind. That is very close. Yeah. These numbers made Bishop the top Canadian and British Empire flying ace of the war and one of Canada's most storied veterans. Mm. But Billy's story does not come without controversy. Was he the ace that he claimed to be? Oh, no. Although Billy's kill count was officially recognized, his later accounts, like those in his book Winged Warfare, sometimes didn't match the known facts. Oh, no. Billy's stories, as written by his son William Arthur Bishop in his book The Courage of the Early Morning, a biography of the great ace of World War I, have led to Billy Bishop's legacy being disputed by some historians. Oh, we got some controversy. Not a lot, but Uh. it's some. You are listening to Dark Poutine, episode 149, Remembrance Day 2020, Canada's Flying Ace, Billy Bishop. Okay, so question. Yeah. Um, name's William. People call him Billy. It's always confused me. Why? It's always confused. What? Why not Will? How do you get, where's there, there's no B in William. I don't know. I'm. I haven't dug into the etymology of that uh, name it's because always, it's unimportant. I've known mil, many a William, yeah, who go by Bill, and it's just like oh, I don't understand this. You know that uh, Jack is actually a nickname for John as well. I can't process. Yeah. Okay. So I was considering covering something unrelated, 
and not doing an, a Remembrance Day episode at all. Mm-hmm. And then I heard from a couple of listeners that they were looking forward to this year's Remembrance Day episode. Yeah. So here, here it is. Here you go. This episode I have had simmering in my puny little brain since day one of this show. Is that what that sound was? Yeah. yeah. So there's no time like the present to get this one on the books. And we've talked about Billy Bishop briefly in our first Remembrance Day episode, uh, but I still felt that this story deserved an entire show dedicated to it. Yeah. Now, I know you're not a big history buff, Scott, but Um, selectively. I have forgotten history. So how, it could have been the marijuana that you smoked in the 80s? It could have been 90s. 90s? Okay. Well, how familiar are you with Billy Bishop's story? Oh, only the broadest sense of when you had told me about this. And I'm like, yeah, wasn't he's like Canada's Red Baron. And you're like, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, that's it. That's all I know. That's all you that, know. That's the extent of my knowledge. So I first became aware of Billy Bishop when I was a boy listening to CBC radio. Hmm. I heard a recording of the musical play, Billy Bishop Goes to War, starring actor Eric Peterson. I was so enamored with the fantastic story in Peterson's performance, I set up my cassette player next to my radio and recorded the play during the next broadcast. So I had a cassette of this that I used to play and listen to all the time. Oh my God. Some Googling might bring you to a recorded performance of the story that has become one of the most widely produced plays in Canadian theater. Has it really? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. It's well worth taking in if you can find uh, a copy of it anywhere. And if you're unfamiliar with Eric Peterson, he went on to play the curmudgeonly Oscar Leroy in the very Canadian television program, Corner uh, Gas. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I never watched Corner Gas. I did. No. I, I, I got to photograph uh, one of the actors, or two mm-hmm. of the actors on there, but no, I've never, never watched it. Billy was the third of four children born to William Avery Bishop Sr. and Margaret Louisa Bishop. His father was a lawyer and graduate of Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto and the registrar of Gray County. And a registrar essentially is somebody who would deal with the official registration of births, deaths, and marriages Mm -hmm. in a Canadian county. I'm not sure if that position still exists, but since the advent of the internet and the move to keeping records online. But Vera, my grandmother, was the deputy registrar in Lunenburg County until her 90th year, retiring just before she passed away. Wow. Uh, She knew who was coming and who was going. And it's a great gig if you're... If you love gossip, which which she kind of did. Oh, who doesn't? Right? Oh, my God. I don't like being the gossip, but my God, do I love overhearing some good old gossip. Yeah, no kidding. According to the 2002 book, The Making of Billy Bishop by Brereton Greenhouse, Worth, the bishop's eldest son, was 10 years older than Billy. Oh, okay. Their second son, Kilborn, had been born two years after Worth, but died in 1903 at the age of seven. Oh, A sister, Louise, completed the family in 1895, and it wasn't uncommon for a child to die. uh, In the 1800s, early 1900s, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Greenhouse writes, quote, Judging from his appearance in later years, Billy must have been a handsome lad of compact, medium proportions. He spoke with a nascent lisp. Psychologically, he was something of a nonconformist by the standards of rural Ontario at the turn of the century. He was never keen on the usual team sports that engrossed most adolescent boys, baseball, lacrosse, hockey. Preferring such individual diversions as swimming, riding, he had his own horse, and rough shooting. His riding and shooting skills were to serve him well in the years to come. Mm. More usually, he was apparently the only young male in Owen Sound who enjoyed attending dancing classes. And Greenhouse goes on to state that there was nothing quote, effeminate about Billy, referring to his interest in dance, which speaks to gender-specific pigeonholing that's mm-hmm. kind of so prevalent in uh, even the last couple of decades. Because oh. this book was written in 2002, and he still oh, used that really? kind of language. Shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of... <laughs> you know, and I'm often described as compact and uh, of medium proportions. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm... You're I'm, lightly boned. I'm lightly... <laughs> I'm dainty. There's nothing wrong with that. No, I mean, I wear it. So I, have no, I have no option. I find it interesting, though, that Billy wasn't much into team sport as he was into the individual ones. Yeah. That was my preference when I grew up. 
and mostly due to my low self-esteem feeling I would somehow let my team down <laughs> and oh, a lack of desire to look stupid in front of my peers when I wasn't good at something. Hmm. So I kind of stuck to myself. I think I was the opposite. I mean, I did wrestle, which is individual, but I, th I, I played rugby and stuff. And I think I like the team sports because it's not all on my shoulders. Yeah. Less pressure. You know, I'm not the only one who's fucking up. <laughs> Many of the details that follow uh, regarding Billy's early adulthood come from the article titled The Real Case of Number 943, William Avery Bishop, by the RMC Museum curator, J. Ross McKenzie. Billy was not the best student, and his high school marks did not bode well for university attendance. Sounds familiar mm -hmm. for myself. Mm -hmm. In February of 1911, when Billy was 17, he decided to apply for the Royal Military College of Canada. His brother Worth had preceded him there and had done remarkably well, which Billy believed bettered his chances of getting in. 17. Yeah. The RMC did not focus on an applicant's grades, but demanded potential recruits write an entrance exam instead. Billy sought out tutors and worked hard to prep for the exam, taking it and passing, but not with flying colors. He placed 42nd out of 43 people who passed the exam. I'll take it. Right? That's that's like, uh, that was my whole scholastic goal. So your nickname just, was probably just squeak by? Or, it, it should have been. It was just, uh, just make it. Yep. That, that Scott just make it him and away. So Billy Bishop, seeking glory and excitement, was off to Royal Military College. From The Courage of the Early Morning by Billy Bishop's son, quote, Billy soon learned that there was nothing romantic about being a recruit at RMC. We are, he wrote home gloomily, the lowest form of military life of any life for that matter. Yeah. That doesn't sound like fun. It doesn't. A recruit has no privileges, he was informed by his senior classmen. A recruit will run at all times when on Parade Square. In Kingston, on his afternoon off, there were to be few of these, he will march, but always at attention, eyes front, no loitering or window shopping. Infractions, and apparently almost everything a recruit did could be interpreted as an infraction by ever-watchful upperclassmen, earned a sharp blow from a swagger stick across the rump or extra drill at 6 o'clock in the morning. And on the theory that even the vigilant seniors must have missed some cadet crimes during the week, each first-year man was soundly trounced every Friday night. Jeez. <laughs> Jeez. This, yeah, the the military, be a Navy, uh, uh, Army. you just going to go Force. through all the bra branches? Yeah, I'm going, going to. I, 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 I just, it's not for me. I don't, I don't have the structure or discipline uh needed I to. think there would be crying I, I think there would be actual crying well no I was in I was in sea cadets for a while right I was in sea cadets for like six months or so six whole months yeah my bag stick to uh, well I would like I remember one standout memory was like we'd all have to stand at attention in the hall yeah while the I don't know whoever he is who gives us the commands. You can't even remember. No, I don't know. General, lieutenant. <laughs> Gen I don't, um, There's not a lot of generals, I don't the, think, in sea cadets. The lieutenant general. I, yep. don't, I don't. Anyway, see, I just remember, like, we're standing at attention, and my nose was so itchy. So itchy. We're all just standing at attention. There's, like, a hundred of us, and I just, I couldn't, like, it's like, oh, God, I can't fucking bear it. And so I had to reach up and just give my nose a little scratch. And he looks right at me, and he's like up on a net, like uh, another a, a top level, looking down at us. And he's like, and he's just like, Scott, don't pick your nose while standing at attention. And I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm like, all I'm thinking is like, I scratched my goddamn nose. There's no picky in, involved, but you're just like, and that was kind of the moment where I'm like, Jesus Christ, I can't even scratch my nose. So. Billy was homesick and depressed, and his son claims the future hero failed his first year at RMC. Mm -hmm. Billy Bishop was also caught cheating on one of his exams, quote, using improper means of obtaining information relative to an examination. He was not expelled, however, he was rusticated. What the deuce? I know. Rustication was the harshest punishment short of expulsion. 
Perhaps maybe it was like a final memo at the place where we used to work. I don't know. Yeah, it's got to be something along those lines. Or, I, or, I or rusticate like, you. you know, we should start using that more in life. To rusticate yeah, each even, other? Yeah, even not knowing the actual definition of it. Let's just... I did look it up and it didn't really make much <laughs> sense. <still there. laughs> yeah, that sounds right. Regardless, Billy's talents with a rifle and horsemanship were recognized and earned him a commission to the Mississauga Horse Regiment. Oh. According to Encyclopedia.com, quote, a bout of pneumonia kept Bishop from going overseas until 1914 when he left for England with the 14th Battalion Canadian Mounted Rifles. Bishop soon learned the real dangers for cavalry in trench warfare and asked to be transferred to the Royal Flying Corps. Wow. Well, we talked about this in uh, the episode that we covered on Billy, and it was this quote specifically. In Winged Warfare, Billy wrote, quote, It was the mud, I think, that made me take to flying. I had fully expected that going into battle would mean for me the saddle of a galloping charger instead of the snug little cockpit of a modern aeroplane. The mud on a certain day in July 1915 changed my whole career in the war. So comfort was his deal. Yeah. And Which, he, I mean, like, I, I, it's not a criticism. If I'm thinking about, oh, yeah, no, you want me to trudge through mud and mm-hmm. water and jungle and in this, or in a plane. Yeah. I know what I'd pick. Just FYI, there's not a lot of jungle in uh, the fields of France. According to author Dan McCaffrey in his book, Billy Bishop, Canadian Hero, Billy put it a little more bluntly. Billy said, it's clean up there. I bet you don't get any mud or horse shit on you up there. If you die, at least it would be a clean death. That's a great quote. Yeah, we, we've used that quote before, but yeah. I like it, it. Is, yeah. Yeah. Billy spent time as an RAF observer waiting for a spot to open up in flight school. He began his flight training on September 1st, 1915, when he reported to 21 Training Squadron at Netheravon. Billy's aerial photography talents earned him a position training other up-and-coming RAF spotters and photographers. So oh. he was really good with a camera, taking pictures of oh, that, the trenches and that, all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's exciting. That would be a fun job, except for the being shot at part. Well, let's not get lost in the semantics here. You're right. According to McCaffrey, quote, Bishop's first combat mission was an aerial spotter for a British artillery. Initially, the aircraft could not get airborne until they had offloaded their bomb load of machine guns. Bishop and pilot Neville flew over German lines near Boisdingham, and when the German howitzer was found, they relayed coordinates to the British, who then bombarded and destroyed the target. In the following months, Bishop flew on reconnaissance and bombing flights, but never fired his machine guns on an enemy Mm. craft. Mm. During one takeoff in April 1916, his aircraft engine failed, and he badly injured his knee. So I would assume that means it went down and he had to eject. And or maybe it just never got airborne. I don't know. But it oh. badly in- injured his knee. Yeah, sure. So it, it doesn't sound like a real auspicious start to this guy's no, career. No, nothing, nothing he has done so far sounds like nothing you know, stands a great, out. Uh, like this is, he, this is where he's going to excel. Right? Like nothing. It really doesn't sound yeah. that way. Yeah. It's very weird. You know what it sounds like? What? It sounds like he was failing up. Yeah. <laughs> We know people who have done lots of that, (laughs) ourselves included. (laughs) Billy returned to England, where he continued his flight training and earned his wings. After flying protective missions over England for a few months, in March of 1917, he was finally sent to France, where he would enter air combat for the first time on March 22nd. He was almost shot down by the anti-aircraft fire while struggling to maintain control of his rickety plane. Yikes. Again. Nothing really great stands out there. Like if I had to bet money, mm-hmm. I would bet that like shot down any moment or, or, or trip, uh, f- walking to the plane and, and <laughs> break, you know, break his neck. Right. According to Peter Kilduff in his book, Billy Bishop, VC lone wolf hunter quote, Billy's first victory came in late afternoon, Sunday, March 25th, 1917. Sea Flight went out on a defensive patrol flying over the city of Arras along the Scarp River and south to the village of St. Leger. Billy wrote of his first kill in winged warfare. Oh boy, what did he say? I had a quick impulse and I followed it. 
I flew straight at the attacking machine gun from a position where he could not see me and opened fire. My tracer bullets, bullets that show a spark and a thin little trail of smoke as they speed through the air, began at once to hit the enemy machine. And they usually called an airplane a machine. The Really? Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's not wrong. No. A moment later, the Hun turned over on his back and seemed to fall out of control. This was just at the time that the Germans were doing some of their famous falling stunts. Their machines seemed to be built to stand extraordinary strains in that respect. They would go spinning down from great heights, and just when you thought they were sure to crash, they would suddenly come under control, flatten out into correct flying position, and streak for the rear of their lines with every ounce of horsepower imprisoned in their engines. It's good with words. When my man fell from his upside-down position to a spinning nosedive, I dived after him. Down he went for a full thousand feet and then regained control. I had forgotten caution and everything else in my wild and overwhelming desire to destroy this thing that, for the first time being, represented all of Germany to me. I could not have been more than 40 yards behind the Hun when he flattened out and I again opened fire. It made my heart leap to see that my smoking bullets hitting the machine just where the closely hooded pilot was sitting. Also, the Hun went into a dive and shot away from me vertically toward the earth. Oh, I'm on the edge of my pilot seat. Suspecting another ruse and still unmindful of what might be happening to my companions in their set to with the other Huns, I went into a wild dive after my particular opponent with my engine full on. With a machine capable of doing 110 to 120 miles an hour on the level, I must have attained 180 to 200 miles in that wrathful plunge. Meteor-like was my descent. However, the Hun seemed to be falling faster still, and got farther and farther away from me. When I was about 1,500 feet up, he crashed into the ground below me. For a long time I had heard pilots speaking of crashing enemy machines, but I never fully appreciated the full significance of crashed until now. There is no other word for it. Oh, I did uh, quite the tale teller. Right? My God. Yeah. Like, he knows how to spin a yarn. He Yes, I think that's what I was looking for. Uh, yeah. What to say, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I could definitely, reading that, I could be like, Okay, I don't know. Some of this sounds fanciful. Like some of this just seems like. But then again, he could just be a great storyteller. Like he's absolutely he's telling the truth. But it's just like he's a very passionate fella. As we'll see, there is a lot of proof that he did shoot down a number of planes. Yeah. So it's not. It's not. Yeah. So I mean, which gives credence to whatever he's saying. That if, if right. he can corroborate a whole bunch, then it's like okay, well, sure. Only five days after shooting down his first enemy, Billy was temporarily promoted to flight commander. As well as participating in missions as part of a squadron, Billy also began completing lone wolf sorties, where he flew out solo looking for enemy aircraft and other targets. Mm. By April 8th, 1917, Billy had become a flying ace, so it only took him two weeks. Jesus Christ. With his fifth kill. Holy shit. According to Dan McCaffrey, to signify Billy as an ace, the nose of his aircraft was painted blue. The Germans, terrified by the pilot's quickly climbing kill count, soon began referring to Billy Bishop as Hell's Handmaiden. (laughs) In April, he was promoted to captain and given command of a flight. Mike, it took me like 10 years to get my fifth kill, and I don't even fly. (laughs) Are you talking about like in that Uh, Atari game the, yeah, sure yes yeah. let's uh, continue with the bike uh-huh. yep exactly that's what yep and we will take a break right here <laughs> perfect timing and we're back so what do you think of billy bishop so far scott all of a sudden he's somebody uh, the, you know why uh, you know what like i um oddly relate to billy bishop what, how, and how so? In the sense of like just lost, not knowing uh, what you're going to be good at. And then just by coincidence or by happenstance, just stumbling like, you know, he wasn't like, you know what? I wanted to be, I want to be the top pilot. I'm going to go and shoot. Like he's like, well, this sounds comfy. Yeah. And you're not going to get shit on you. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of how I live my life. Like, well, this sounds like it's, 
Yeah. Not as hard as that. Let me do it. And uh, so I, I hear you, Billy. Billy was a leader and an inspiration to his fellow pilots and other Allied soldiers who heard of his exploits in the air. According to Lieutenant Colonel David Bashaw, in his 2002 Canadian Military Journal article, The Incomparable Billy Bishop, The Man in the Myths, quote, his press-on spirit proved to be a tremendously stabilizing force and an example for others. However, he was so obsessed with scoring that he was probably not a particularly good flight commander. Mm. He did not normally take the time to bring subordinates along in their combat evolutions. And on at least two occasions, he abandoned his escort duties once disastrously to hair off after prey on his own. However, this was probably due more to lapses in judgment than anything else. Also, his propensity for bragging, his lone wolf tactics, and his bloodthirstiness rankled some of his comrades' British public school attitudes of contrived modesty, teamwork, and limited displays of emotion, and undoubtedly made him some enemies. Mm -hmm. That said, Bishop had joined the war effort to kill Germans, not to bake cookies for them. (laughs) True enough. Some of his contemporaries were probably frustrated with their own inability to score and were therefore jealous of his success. So when they, when we're constantly referring to him as scores, that's taking down a, yeah. an enemy plan. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And why was he so successful? First and foremost was his willingness to go into harm's way. He was simply flying much more than his colleagues, which in turn presented him with more scoring opportunities. Makes sense. Second, he was an excellent dynamic shooter who successfully transferred game hunting skills into aerial combat. And third, he used the element of surprise to maximum benefit, utilizing hit-and-run tactics whenever possible. Although more vulnerable when alone, he also had more tactical flexibility. Fourth, he had a higher likelihood of combat encounters behind German lines. Enemy scouts on patrol would often avoid allied formations if the odd and attack parameters did not suit them. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you don't want to get Mm -hmm. into a fight if you don't have to. Bishop would also have been exposed to individual German aircraft behind the lines in transit or on individual training missions or maintenance air tests. Lastly, he had superb eyesight and simply spotted more targets than others. Yeah, that's quite, so I, I get the, um, you know, maybe not being a particularly good flight commander, but again, it goes back to his, he's not a team sports person. Right, exactly. You know, yep. and this makes me uh, wonder, um, those are, uh, all of those are four good points. Um, but it makes me, like, I suddenly am thinking, like, what kind of rules of engagement were there back then for a- enemy? Like, I think if you see it and you can shoot that's it. That's kind of what I was thinking, whether yeah. it's a t- training flight or whether it's whatever. If you see a German plane, you shoot it down. Some young dudes in there, mm-hmm. you know, and, great plane and, and he just decides, yeah, I'm going to take it out. Yeah. Because at the end of the day... If he doesn't take them out now, he's going to have to later when they're fully trained. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not, you're playing with the rules you have at the time. And so it just made me curious, mm-hmm. like hearing who, who the people he was taking out, it made me curious of like, I wonder what kind of. Well, he even took out balloons too. Like they had those large balloons that would be set to overlook the battlefields kind of thing. So That's, that sounds fun. That'd be video game material right there. Oh, it pretty much yeah. is. Yeah be a boring game if it was like balloon versus balloon. (laughs) They just sort of float around. Oh, I got a turn. Again, according to Lieutenant Colonel Bashow's article, quote, at precisely 3.57 a.m. on June 2nd, Bishop took off and flew first over an airfield near Cambrai, where no activity was observed, and then over a second field, where he saw and attacked six Albatross D-3 scouts and one two-seater on the ground. After Bishop's initial strafing pass, the Germans took off to engage him. He later claimed to have shot down three of them, two very close to the ground in the takeoff environment, and then headed westward toward the front lines and sanctuary. En route, he successfully evaded a German flying patrol and returned to Files Camp Farm, with a lot of battle damage to his aircraft after being airborne for one hour and 43 minutes. Shit. So. That's intense. Like you. But here's the thing. He was alone. It's not corroborated like some of his other. Yeah. That's right. 
These exploits got Billy even more notoriety, and the calls came for him to receive the Victoria Cross, Damn. which is the highest decoration for valor achievable in the British Empire. I got four. <laughs> As considerations for that went on, Billy kept racking up kill after kill, and by August 16, 1917, when he was pulled out of combat for arrest, he had claimed 47 victories, making him the top ace in the Empire. 47 in, like, uh, just like three or four months. Yeah, that's, that sounds excessive. It really does. Although there were no witnesses to Billy's June 2nd raid, he was rewarded the Victoria Cross regardless, along with two other of the Empire's highest honors for valor in a ceremony at Buckingham Palace performed by King George V, grandfather of the current monarch, Queen Elizabeth II. Son of a bitch. Wow, that is a substantial honor. Right? Um, published in the London Gazette on the 11th of August, 1917, Billy's citation for the Victoria Cross read, for most conspicuous bravery, determination, and skill, Captain Bishop, who had been sent out to work independently, flew first of all to an enemy aerodrome, finding no machines about. He flew to another aerodrome about three miles southeast, which was at least 12 miles the other side of the line. Seven machines, some with their engines running, were on the ground. He attacked these from about 50 feet, and a mechanic who was starting one of the engines was seen to fall. One of the machines got off the ground at a height of 60 feet. Captain Bishop fired 15 rounds into it at very close range, and it crashed to the ground. A second machine got off the ground into which he fired 30 rounds at 150 yards range, and it fell into a tree. Two more machines then rose from the aerodrome. One of these he engaged at a height of 1,000 feet, emptying the rest of his drum of ammunition. This machine crashed 300 yards from the aerodrome after which Captain Bishop emptied a whole drum into the fourth hostile machine and then flew back to his station. Four hostile scouts were about 1,250 feet above him for about a mile of his return journey, but they would not attack. His machine was very badly shot about by a machine gun fire from the ground. So I'm assuming aerodrome equals airport? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. It's like a... It's Military. A, yeah, it's like a little installation that's set up. It's not like a full airport, but it's I like gotcha. a, yeah. a place for them to take yeah. off with their planes. So next was the Distinguished Service Order. His citation for the Distinguished Service Order read, For conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty, while in a single-seater he attacked three hostile enemy machines two of which he brought down, although in the meantime he was himself attacked by four other hostile machines. His courage and determination have set a fine example to others. I, I always say that about you too, Mike. Do you? I really admire your uh, conspicuous gallantry. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. I sit behind a microphone. Conspicuously. Yeah, fair and enough. Gallantry. Yeah. Mm. His citation for the Distinguished Service Order Bar read, for conspicuous gallantry, again, and devotion to duty when engaging hostile aircraft. His consistent dash and great fearlessness have set a magnificent example to the pilots of his squadron. He has destroyed no less than 45 hostile machines within the past five months, frequently attacking enemy formations single-handedly and on all occasions displaying a fighting spirit and determination to get close quarter with his opponents, which have earned the admiration of all in contact with him. So it's, it's a lot of uh, admiration he's getting here. Yeah. And honestly, here's the thing. Mm. If you need somebody to hold up as like, here's this great guy, why not? Sure. You know, people saw him shoot down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like it's coming out from, uh, you know, nobody's ever seen anything and he's sp spinning these long tails. No, it's not like he went to uh, Spain for lunch or something while everybody else was fighting and then said, oh, I was in a terrible fight. Sounds like a great plan, though. Billy was given the temporary rank of major and appointed as the chief instructor at the School of Aerial Gunnery before his return to Canada for a much-needed break. Billy was received as a hero at home and gave a huge boost to the flagging morales of Canadians sick of losing their boys to a war so far away. Uh, morale is the key word. On his trip home, Billy married his longtime fiance Margaret Eaton Burden, on October 17, 1917. Even the American papers picked up on Billy's storied military career and word of his recent wedding. 
a full-page Pittsburgh Press article about Billy's recent nuptials, written in late October, said, quote, Cupid wings the premier airman of England. The article went on to tout Billy as, quote, the hero of 110 single combats with Hun flyers and destroyer of 70 German planes. It describes Billy as, quote, an unheroic little chap who seldom gets excited even when fighting against 3 to 1 odds at 100 miles an hour, 10,000 feet up in the air. Cheekily, it continues, but when Cupid attacked him, well, that was different. Oh, what, what? Oh, young love. What a burden of a last name for Margaret, eh? Oh, that's terrible. So that I, was a really... I, it, I had to say it. Did you? I would be doing a disservice to the world had I not. Would you? Yeah, everybody was thinking it. It was at this time that Billy began writing his book, Winged Warfare, that we've already quoted from. According to Dan McCaffrey, Bishop went back to England in April of 1918 and was promoted to major and given command of number 85 squadron, the Flying Foxes. What a great name. It's a band, isn't it? The Flying Foxes? Oh, Fleet Foxes. Sorry. Oh, wow. This was a newly formed squadron and Bishop was given the freedom to choose many of the pilots and the squadron was equipped with SE-5A scout planes and left for Petite Synth, France on the 22nd of May, 1918. On the 27th of May, after familiarizing himself with the area and the opposition, Bishop took a solo flight to the front. That's what he liked to do. He downed a German observation plane in his first combat since August of 1917, followed with two more the next day. From May 30th to June 1st, Bishop downed six more aircraft, including German ace Paul Billick, bringing his score to 59 and reclaiming his top ace title from James McCudden, who had claimed it while Bishop was in Canada, and he was now the leading Allied ace. Classic Billy Bishop. Classic Billy Bishop. Billy was yanked out of combat again on June 18, 1918, by the Canadian government who feared that were Billy to have been killed in combat, Canadian morale both at, at the front and back home would also take a nosedive. Sure, it probably would. Again, according to McCaffrey, quote, the order specified that he was to leave, Fr to leave France by noon on the 19th of June. On that morning, Bishop decided to fly one last solo patrol. In just 15 minutes of combat, he added another five victories to his total. He claimed to have downed two scout planes and caused two others to collide with each other and shot down a German reconnaissance craft. So this was a solo mission. This a one. solo mission, yeah. And it was his last one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In late August 1918, Bishop was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and was given the post of, quote, Officer Commanding Designate of the Canadian Air Force Section of the General Staff Headquarters Overseas Military Forces of Canada. That was the title? That was the title. That was a book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Billy was discharged from service on New Year's of 1918, a month and a half after the signing of the armistice. The war was over, and Billy Bishop claimed he had 72 victories. And for his 72 victories, he got the Distinguished Flying Cross, which Whoa. was the highest uh, award that an airman could get next to the Victoria Cross, that Billy was also, also the a, yeah, recipient, of, recipient yeah. of, and the first airman to receive that. Oh, was he? Uh, yeah. Mm. His citation for the Distinguished Flying Cross read, A most successful and fearless fighter in the air whose acts of outstanding bravery have already been recognized by the awards of the Victoria Cross, Distinguished Service Order, Bar to the Distinguished Service Order, and Military Cross. For the award of the Distinguished Flying Cross now conferred upon him, he has rendered singly valuable services in personally destroying 25 enemy machines in 12 days, five of which he destroyed on the last day of his service at the front. The total number of machines destroyed by this distinguished officer is 72 and his value as a moral factor to the Royal Air Force cannot be overestimated. And I think that's why they were just like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, 72. Sure, sure. Yeah. Because it's um, the morale that he is providing, the boost he's providing to other troops in the country. and Yeah. Yeah. In his 2002 article, Billy Bishop, Brave Flyer, Bold Liar, oh. Brereton Greenhouse wrote that many of Billy's kills, especially the final ones, were unverifiable 
and the actual total of enemy aircraft the Billy destroyed was only 27. You know what? I haven't ever destroyed one. So yeah. uh, I'm still fine if it's 27 right. with this guy being highly revered. And so is Greenhouse. He said that although Billy may have been an inveterate liar, he was by no means a coward. So that's good. Exactly, yeah. Greenhouse went on to write, quote, Even so, Bishop was as brave as they come. It is a common but quite false assumption that because a man is a proven and consistent liar, he must also be a coward, or alternatively, because he is honest, he must be brave. The human spirit is more complicated than that, and all sorts of strange and contrary qualities may coexist. Whatever else Bishop may or may not have done during his first tour at the front between March and August 1917, he flew, mostly unaccompanied, in a Newport 17 fighter, a plane that was distinctly inferior in speed and firepower Mm -hmm. to the Albatross D-3s flown by German fighter pilots at the time. And the Germans flew in bunches, Ketten or Staffeln. I don't know what that means because I'm not German. (laughs) No parachute and a machine constructed of wood and doped fabric would burn like tinder if a spark from the engine or an incendiary bullet touched it. Toward the end of his tour, he flew a faster SE-5, a better machine that still lacked the firepower of an Albatross D-3. I believe he deserved most of his medals, but not for doing the things he claimed to have done and was credited with. Rather, he deserved his decorations for flying alone deep in German airspace in a fragile butterfly of an aircraft. Well, it's not the description you want your aircraft to have. That wouldn't give me confidence fighting. But, you know, I... So he's not poo-pooing Billy Bishop at yes. all. I think that was very well written and, mm-hmm. and seemingly unbiased. Like, because he's admitting, he, he's saying like, yeah, I don't believe him, but I still respect the hell out of him. Right, exactly. And, and he deserved a, deserves a lot of praise. And that's kind of how I'm feeling so far. Yeah. You know, like I, I get that the yarns were spun in order to build morale for yeah. the country. Billy did well touring the U.S. and giving talks about aerial warfare, and he had an importing firm until the Wall Street crash of 1929 wiped him out financially. He had to come back to Canada to start over as the vice president of the McCall Frontenac Oil Company. Well, that's probably not the worst start over. You, you kind of land be. on your feet. You know, yeah, in oil, in yeah. uh, the oil industry as vice president, you'll be fine. You'll be okay. You'll be right. In 1936, as tensions in Europe were growing again, From Wikipedia, quote, Billy Bishop was appointed the first Canadian Air Vice Marshal. Shortly after the outbreak of war in 1939, he was promoted to the rank of Air Marshal in the Royal Canadian Air Force. He served during the war as director of the Royal Canadian Air Force and was placed in charge of recruitment. Okay. Great position. I would imagine that right up his alley. He was so successful in this role that many applicants had to be turned away. Bishop created a system for training pilots across Canada and became instrumental in setting up and promoting the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, which trained over 167,000 airmen in Canada during the Second World War. In 1942, he appeared as himself in the film Captains of the Clouds, a Hollywood tribute to the RCAF. Oh, interesting. And, you know, it's in, it's also interesting how, you know, he started off as a fairly selfish individual. And I mean that in the, like, again, s- solo. Yeah. Doesn't want teams, yeah. sports and stuff. But nearing the a- end here, like nearing the end of the story, he's um, doing an amazing job. I wouldn't, don't know if at leading, but, you know, um, focused on others. Right. As opposed to himself. Well, that's, helping the country, really. Well, that's what, I, that's what I'm saying, Yeah. Billy retired in 1952, but with the outbreak of the Korean War, he wanted back into the military for more recruiting. But by that time, he was too sick and his battered body was too tired to be of any use. Billy Bishop died in his sleep on the 11th of September, 1956, at the age of 62, while he was wintering in Palm Beach, Florida. That's a good place to... Not terrible. A good place to uh, winter. And there have been many tributes to Billy Bishop for his uh, service contributions here in Canada the years after. And some of those tributes include, in 1967, his induction into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. 
The Air Force Association of Canada approved the establishment of a trophy to commemorate the late Air Marshal W.A. Bishop V.C. in recognition of his, quote, outstanding contribution to the legacy of excellence in Canadian aviation. Billy Bishop's childhood home was repurposed into the Billy Bishop Home and Museum in 1987. Mm. The museum is located in Owen Sound, of course, because that's where he lived. Yeah. I don't think they would pick the house up and move it. Um, well, I mean, yeah. it doesn't sound easy. The museum has exhibits on the family, Bishop himself, and veterans. There's a permanent exhibit which, with information on Bishop at the Grey Roots Museum and Archives just south of Owen Sound. In addition to television and film, Bishop has also been featured on Canadian stamps. In August of 1994, Canada Post issued Billy Bishop Air Ace as part of the Great Canadian Series, and they were designed by Pierre Fontaine based on illustrations by Bernard Leduc, and the stamps were 43 cents. Very um, specific number. Right? (laughs) Well, that's what stamps were probably worth at the time. Round that shit up. Exactly. There's a replica of Billy's Newport 17 fighter at Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport. Oh. Billy Bishop Airport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, I, one, don't think, I don't think there's a Scott Hemingway Airport out there. No. Anyway. And this is only one of two airports that bear his oh, name. Of course, of course. Several other places have also honored Bishop uh, bearing his namesake. So two airports in Ontario. Uh, there's a Billy Bishop private roadway. Of course. Near Ottawa Airport. Sure. Uh, Billy Bishop Way near Downsview Airport in Ontario, Billy Bishop Park in Ottawa, uh, Mount Bishop, a 2,850 meter high mountain in Alberta on the Alberta-British Columbia border. Well, no. Uh, Bishop Building, the first Canadian Air Division and the Canadian NORAD region headquarters in Winnipeg. We, Canada has a NORAD? Yeah. Shit. We are north. And also, Billy Bishop Legion, Branch 176 in Vancouver. I've been there. Have you? I definitely have. I wonder if I have. Yeah, and there's other places that were named after Billy. And you know what? Whether he told the whole truth or not, Billy Bishop was and still is a Canadian hero. And I kind of like my heroes with a little bit of dirt on them anyway. Yeah, that's actually... It certainly makes it a more interesting character. I can imagine now if I was another fighter pilot... And I had been um, correctly producing numbers while you're going up against somebody. I can understand there would be people who who would be quite upset at that. Here goes Billy taking off after some Germans again, yeah, yeah. and who knows what how what the outcome of that yeah. little foray was? But yeah. he would come back and say, "I shot them down." Yeah, oh, you know, oh, did you get you get 112 today, Billy? Like I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Would, but but yeah, like it. As, as a character, as a person, like an individual and a storyteller, and it, I, I quite, I quite uh, am fond of him, and I'm glad he's received the recognition and everything that he has. And that is it for our Remembrance Day episode. I mean, Remembrance Day is going to be uh, a little weird this year because people aren't going to be able to uh, go out and commemorate like we usually do, but... Um, yeah, that's true. But um, I I guess there's going to be a lot of um, streaming services online, I gather, from Veterans Affairs Canada and the Legion website. As long as this has been going on now, the world's adapting. We're adapting to not being able to gather in groups. And and, and the last thing you want to do is have some soldiers who are very elderly in contact with people who have coronavirus People who might have been walking down on Granville Street on Halloween night without masks grouped together. Let's, yeah. not, let's not have them go around these heroes. Those douche canoes. Yeah. Wow. And that's it. That's like I say, that's it for this week's episode. That was episode, good. So. I, I dug that. I dug that. Yeah, it was kind of fun. Yeah, and I kind of need fun. Right? Fun is good. It, it is. Yeah, it is. It's important. I guess it's time to listen to some voicemails. Let's do it. Yeah. I think we should. I, I'm almost as eager to read the translations as I am to hear the emails. Every time. It just It's such a kick I get. Uh, here's one uh, that came to us last Monday. Hi, Mike and Scott. This is Sarah. I'm calling from New Hampshire. I'm a Yumber Yarder, and I love you guys. You're fantastic. I wanted to impart a little bit of a, a nugget, nugget of wisdom, if, if, you, uh, if you may. So with your most recent 
podcast on the the three is complicated. Yes. So I personally am polyamorous. I have three partners. We all met organically. We are all wonderfully together. Um, We have sort of a quad set up and it's wonderful. What you're describing is what we in that community call unicorn hunting. And the woman who aided and abetted the murder of the first woman uh, was the unicorn in this situation. It is unethical, and people in the polyamory and ethical non-monogamy community uh, really, really disdain this sort of behavior where a couple is trying to add to their relationship or looking for a third or something like that. Generally speaking, it doesn't involve murder. In this case, obviously, it did. But I wanted to give you a little nugget of wisdom and say I really appreciate the fact that you're talking about how, you know, ethical non-monogamy can be a good thing, can be ethical. Yes, it often is. Sometimes it is not. And unfortunately, when drama ensues, this kind of thing sometimes happens. But anyway, thank you so much for everything you do. I really appreciate it. And um, don't take a shit in your hat. Thank you. Bye. Well, I'm going to anyway. I but, just did. But thanks, Sarah. That, Sarah, that's some great clarity. And But here's the thing. I, I didn't ever want to use the words polyamorous in the episode because my brother is. So. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not going to get into his personal stuff. No, no. Here. No, that's his uh, bag. But yeah. But yeah. Uh, so I'm quite aware of the polyamorous yeah. community. And uh, this is why I didn't bring up that word during. Because you didn't want it to try to be associated with what was happening. Not even remotely. Yeah, because yeah. it is not. Yeah. Because um, it is. And as I said in the episode, like, I don't care what people do. If it's working for you. Yeah. And it, everybody's happy and wants the key part wants to be a part of it. Yeah. It can be incredibly beautiful. What a great name for that. Unicorn hunting. I've never heard that. I love ha- it. I have heard have it. Have you? Oh, I yeah. haven't. But it's anytime you're trying to deceive or coerce somebody into something like that, it's just, it's not going it, to, it's going to be nah, disastrous. Ain't going to work. Yeah. But when, when uh, a, a choice by all, it's beautiful. All right. Next up, it looks like we have somebody from, well, it's a 403 number. So it's probably Alberta. Let's have a listen. Hi, Mike. Hi, Scott. My name is Marissa. I am a drugs and addictions counseling student in Alberta. And uh, (laughs) we were actually talking about uh, racism and slavery in Canada and how some people are learning new things. And I actually referenced you guys' Africville podcast. And my teacher absolutely fell in love and uh, got me to share it with the entire class. And now it's a class assignment. So. Way to go, guys. I feel like you guys are doing great. I love listening to your podcast. I've been listening to it for years, and hopefully you guys carry on. And respectfully, go shit in your hat. Bye. 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 Well, there you go. Yes. That's that's what I, I want. I want us to be to the point where a teacher listens and that's, says, hey, you, you guys should listen to this because it's fun and that interesting. Is, that and, is really, really cool. And I the, the, so far, two voicemails, and they've, but a huge, much-needed smile on my face. So this was great. Thank you both. Well, I, I never put a smile on your face, but that's on purpose. You're a smile thief. <laughs> I'm a smile thief. <laughs> Mike Brown, smile thief. At your service. PD. <laughs> Spiritual vampire. <laughs> a vortex of happiness. This one looks like a local one. Uh-oh. Oh, hi, Mike and Scott. My name is Gabe, and I'm calling from beautiful Burnaby, B.C., the home of Burnaby Joe Sackick and a 1994 Canucks playoff legend, Cliff Ronning. I just want to thank you so much for doing your show each week. I work security, and it really helps me decompress after stressful days. I'm finding it especially difficult dealing with uh, the anti-mask crowd right now. Your show always uh, also helps me get through an extremely tough uh, breakup. Thanks so much again. You're making this world a better place. Stay safe and go shin your hat. Bye. That's awesome. That that's really awesome. I'm sorry to hear about the uh, rough breakup because that is it it, happens, that is that yeah. is is rough as hell. And I totally think he said he's working in security, and yeah. that is. Um, uh, if he works for that large company that I used to work for, I'm, I really empathize. Well, I was, I was going to go a different direction. I was just like, when he talked about very fr- his frustration with people who mm-hmm. aren't wearing masks, he has to be out doing his job. That's right. 
He's not choosing. Like that's he has to go and do that. Respect the man. Put on your goddamn mask. Yeah. It's not just for you. It is for you to be it, nice to somebody. It's more so for other people. Right. Be nice to people for fuck's yeah. sake. He <laughs> has to be out there doing his job. Yeah. There's a lot of people. I was at my dad's hospice today. These people have to work. Wear your mask. These, they're working. You need to finish the sentence though. Uh, then when's that going to ever happen? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Period. There you go. Period. All right, uh, let's get on to some Patreon shout-outs. Mm-hmm. Uh, first up, we have, from Port Dover, Ontario, oh. Megan Souls. Hi, Megan. Megan yep. Souls. Yep. yep, Port Dover. Right? Yep. Port Dover. Yep, yep. The good old Port of the Dover, as they say. And, and uh, what does Megan do in Port Dover, Tugbo- Ontario? Tugboat captain. Wow. Yep. Yeah, in the port. Is she... Uh, in the port of... Dover. Is she the tugboat captain that was responsible for the Edmund Fitzgerald, perhaps? Oh, no. no. She's like 22. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. But she... she, she her tugboat primarily tugs boats. Good. Primarily, sometimes logs. But then wouldn't it be called a log boat? No, it's still a tugboat. Or, or a tug log. I'm confused now. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Well, thank you. Megan Souls. Many thank yous. And this one is a name that looks familiar. Kim Rintoul. Oh, that does sound familiar. Well, here's the thing. There's a Rintoul who is a sports, sports, sportscaster here in Vancouver. Oh, yes. I wonder if she is related. I think his name is Scott. You Scott see, Rintoul. Did, was, he, did he, was he a redhead? I believe he is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder if they are related. Well, she's from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, regardless. Hmm. And what does Kim Rintoul do with her time in Saskabush? In Saskabush, uh, what she does is um, she manages forests uh, in the fire capacity when they do pre-burns. Okay. To, to mitigate. Wow, that's very specific. Yeah, to, to mitigate. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> to, to mitigate uh, future fires. Um, so, yeah. So, like, what a job, eh? You get a blowtorch and you just get to go head into the woods and just burn shit. Lots of woods in Saskatchewan. Lot, lots of, pff, the forests of Saskatchewan are famous. They're known for Every, their forests. Everybody talks about the forests of Saskatchewan. Oh, help us all. Yeah. It's, it's, no, it's great there. Uh, next we have Christopher Tharp. Sweet Tharp. And where is Christopher from? Christopher is from, um... Um, Denver, Colorado. Oh, he's from Denver. Denver, Denver, Colorado. Well, there you go. Yeah. And what does he do in the Mile High City? Well, you know what everybody does in the Mile High City now? They own pot shops. Right. Yeah. So that's what Christopher owns, a pot shop. shop. Uh, He sells marijuana and other, you know, THC related substances. Uh, He calls it Tharp City. Is he thinking about moving to Oregon where every drug is now non decriminalized? Is it? Yes. Wow. Yeah. It's about time. It's funny how I twig on those kind of things in the news. It's like they're talking about things and and I hear drugs and booze and my brain still goes. What? Ping. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So the store's called Tharp City. Okay. And what, what does he sell specifically at Tharp City? Well, primarily marijuana. Oh. Marijuana. Oh, I was hoping it would be like fancy bongs for Tommy Chong. Oh, they may. I don't know. No. Yeah. Because I don't really talk. Since Christopher opened his marijuana shop, we don't talk. Anymore. He's too busy. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's well, thriving. good for him. Yeah. Hey, oh, look at my third Bentley. So I don't care. Tharp. Right. I don't care. Tharp. Tharp. No, I don't Come need on. the, I'm just, I'm struggling out here. Quit showing off. And your here's your third money. Bentley. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got a bit bitter. Well, you know. We Canadians do tend to have that tall poppy complex. We do. Yeah. We do. We got to cut them down. We do chop them. <laughs> chop them down. Make sure they go away. But go, go, go shop at Tharp City. At Tharp City? Mm-hmm. All right. He was going to call it Tharps R Us, but <laughs> you went with Tharp City. Oh boy. Yeah. So guess who's back for, uh, for donut money? Uh, the real Slim Shady? No, it's oh. Sally Norris. Sally? Sally is back. 
And uh, she says, Mike and Scott, many thanks as always, as always for continuing to feed us our weekly dose of dark routine in these challenging times. It's always very much appreciated and enjoyed. Sally N. Smiley face. Well, you are also very much appreciated, Sally. Right? Very much so. And next up we have Risa New Year Ramirez. Oh, and delightful she's, name. Yeah, it is delightful. As long as maybe Richard Ramirez. Well, uh, well yeah, okay. I mean, you know. Why did you have to sully it? I didn't. Well, it's he, not sullied. He's in Syria, the other. I he mean. has good cheekbones. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah. Well, you turned that around. Well, it, it, that was pointed out to me by one of our listeners. <laughs> and she knows who she is. <laughs> Risa says, hi, Mike and Scott recently got into your podcast during the start of the pandemic due to a recommendation from a friend. Love your content. Looking forward to listening to every one of your podcasts. Thanks for doing what you do. Smiley face. No, thank you, Risa. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We really appreciate anybody who has supported us. Patron, donut money donor, person who sends interact, whatever you've done for us. Saying hi. Carrier pigeon listening to the show, yeah. any of those things, <laughs> we really appreciate it. Holy shit, do we? If you want to help keep Dark Poutine going, you can become a patron or at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. And if you don't already subscribe to the show, it mean a lot to us if you did. You can easily find us on any podcatcher. Check out our website, darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Please take the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook. And most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.